All right. Hello, everybody. Everybody coming in? Maybe if I start playing. Nope. Tried. I tried. Uh, so real quick before we start singing, uh, uh, Friday, just in if any of you have time or if you're in Jerome or want to go to Jerome, we're doing a kickoff, summer kickoff worship park event that starts at 3 p.m. at the City Bank Park that's in Jerome. I guess that's what it's called. I don't know. It's, just, just drive around the parks until you see us. We'll be there uh, at between 3 and 6. Friday, between 3 and 6. If you have any other questions, it's, um, you know, it's going to be youth, but everybody's welcome. And uh, we're just going to have fun and party in, party the, the, bring the party in for the summer, right? So, what am I doing? I know what I'm doing. Let's pray. Let's start there. And then we'll figure it out. <clears throat> Father, we thank you so much for this evening. We thank you for this week. We thank you for today. Um, Lord, I, I pray, God, that for this little short amount of time tonight that we could turn our hearts to you, Lord, that we could uh, repent of our idolatrous, idolatrous thoughts and that we could look to you. Lord, I pray that you would forgive us of our sin, uh, fill us afresh in here with your mercies and grace and your spirit. God, we thank you for your great love towards us. You are more good than, than we would ever know. Without you, there is no good, and we thank you. Just pray this tonight in Jesus' name. If we're going to do a little vocal warm-up, <clears throat> let's do this. Everyone knows this one. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. Let's do it again. For God is so good. So
Jesus, the only one who could ever say.
we thank you so much for, for the fact that you live in us. And Lord, just as we continue to sing, may we keep that at the forefront of our mind. We can open up our hearts, we can open up our hands, and we can receive your fresh forgiveness today. And not only that, but that you live in us, and that's the hope of glory. And without that, we have no hope. But we do have hope because we have that, because of you. If we sing this out, we need you, God. Let it be the cry of our soul that we need thee every hour.
sing to you tonight and though you slay us and you do slay us God you bring Christ out of us and no matter what the slaying is in each of our lives right now we can sit here collectively and say yes and amen God you are good no matter what it is that we've got going on whether it's cancer or finances or family or prodigals you are good God and we worship you and we sing you to you and, and we just we're so blessed to be able to sing you to to a God that loves us more than anything we'll ever know. God, we thank you so much for everything. In Jesus' name. Amen. didn't work out either okay I don't know who was up here before but water all right do I got everything now if you have your Bibles with you open up we are going to Zephaniah how many of you have been to Zephaniah before ah two all right, Zephaniah actually is a pretty incredible book. I'm excited about uh, the study. It's small, so uh, it won't take us probably more than three weeks to go through it. You never know, you know, it is me. So, But as we look at Zephaniah, it's going to follow kind of a unique pattern, so let me kind of lay it out for you. It starts with the concept that God owns all the earth. And so he begins with a section, what we would call theologically, cosmic covenantal judgment. So it's judgment over the whole earth. It's basically a, a passage of decreation. So you have a passage of creation. The Lord created the heavens and the earth, right? And then on cosmic covenantal judgment passages, you have God decreating the end of all the earth. You guys tracking with me? And the statement that's being made when he does that is, this is all mine. Now, the rest of the, of the challenges or uh, um, convictions that the Lord's going to lay out before his people and before the nations would be much easier for people to understand if they understood the first part. Oftentimes it has been said, if you can get past the first couple of verses in the Bible, you're good to go. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the first statement of the Bible is a statement of ownership. This is all the Lord's. He made it. It's his. And so after he lays out this section, he's going to talk, he's going to lay out five problems with his people, the nation of Israel, five focused issues. And then he's going to give a call to repentance. Now, the call to repentance is roughly in the middle of the book. So we're going to refer back to the call to repentance a few times. So five problems, a call to repentance, the oracle of the nations. You remember we've talked about this among the prophets. Whenever the Lord is talking about a global judgment, the global judgment is one for his own people and for all the nations of the world. So it's not, it's not separated. So first we have five problems, call to repentance, the oracle of the nations. There's several nations listed out that the Lord has issue with. And then he's going back to five more problems with his people. So you have a bracket. 
like a bookshelf, starts with five problems, ends with five problems, in the middle, a call to repentance. You get what I'm saying? So he's going to lay out the judgment and the, and the issues that are going on, and then he finishes the prophetic book, like most prophetic books, with the hope of restoration. So you have the challenge of judgment. There will be a day of judgment. The issues about what that judgment's about to both the nations and to Israel. In the center of that, a call to repentance. Hey, you know, you don't, you don't have to be in this judgment. Right? There's a way where we're able to escape judgment. And Zephaniah has a unique way of telling us that. In Zephaniah 1, it says, The word of the Lord came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. <coughs> so, we have a lot here. One, the divine authority of the message. It is the word from the Lord to Zephaniah delivered to us. So he starts with the divine authority of the message. He tells us something about his genealogy. He's one of Hezekiah's kids. You remember Hezekiah? The Hezekiah is the king when Shennacherib, the Assyrians, were coming against Judah. He laid out the, ch the charges of Shennacherib before the Lord and said, God, look what he's saying about you. That's God's deliverance. You see God supernaturally delivered Judah without needing Judah's help. God fights the battle. There's a lot of Psalms and, and uh, uh, still today songs written about God's deliverance. You have pictures of that in Ezekiel with Gog and Magog, right? You have pictures of God's divine deliverance. And so that was lived out in the time of Hezekiah. And he tells us the reign he's in. Josiah, that means it's the last great revival. So this message is delivered during the last great revival of Judah before they go into judgment in Babylon. That gives you the timing. Now you heard the message of the book, remember? Decreation language, all the earth is mine. Here's five issues with my people. Here's five issues surrounded by the idea of, of a call to repentance and the key to it all in um, Zephaniah chapter 2, 1 through 3 is really found in the name Zephaniah. So Zephaniah's name is pretty interesting. Zephan means hidden. And Yahweh, Zephan Yahweh, Zephaniah, Zephan Yahweh hidden in the Lord. And we sang a, a few songs, and I'm a little more sensitive to it because I know the message, but the idea in the songs and the things that we're singing is our need for God and that I've been, uh, I've been crucified with Christ. What does that mean? That's not me living anymore. I'm in the body of Christ. I'm hidden in him. So the key to escaping God's judgment is found in the name Zephaniah, to be hidden in Christ. The call to repentance for his people, be hidden in Christ. The call to the nations to escape judgment. How do I escape judgment? Be hidden in Christ. What does the scripture tell us? We are not appointed unto wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, right? All believers, they have that promise. That promise is absolutely true. So when we when we look at that, you 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 begin to see this picture of finding a a hidden place, a place to hide in Christ or in God. There's a, an old psalm, uh, uh, an old hymn. It goes like this. Oh, safe to the rock that is higher than I, my soul in its conflicts and sorrows would fly. So sinful, so weary thine, thine I would be. Thou blessed rock of ages, I'm hiding in thee. That should remind you of another song. We'll talk about that at the end. In the calm of the noontide, in sorrow's lone hour, in times when temptation casts, <coughs> excuse me, over me its power, in the tempest of life, on its wide heaving sea, thou blessed rock of ages, I'm hiding in thee. So the idea of that hymn, of the, of the rock of ages hymn, we'll talk about it at the end, and the entire book of Zephaniah, 
is if you want to escape the judgment of God, the wrath of God, you must find a hiding place in God. That's the solution. That's where we find our deliverance ultimately. So as we jump in, verse 1 really covers the intro. And then we have the deconstruction language I told you about. God declaring all the earth is his. Look at it, 2 and 3. I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away birds of the heaven, fish of the sea, the rubble of the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. So it's a statement of ultra ownership and that God is going to judge it all. So all of it will find a place in judgment. Jesus talked about the exact same thing in Matthew 13, verse 41 through 43. Jesus said this, the son of man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of of their father, let him who has ears to hear, hear. So you have the deconstruction language is just a language of the obliteration of the wicked, the cleansing, if you will, of the earth and the kingdom of God and its ultimate reign. So he starts out, Zephaniah gives us a clue, right? I need to be hidden in the Lord. I want to find my place in him. It comes during the last revival of Judah. So this is the last good king after Josiah, four bad kings. From worse to worse to worse to worse till slavery, utter exile. So he begins in verse 4 to talk about this idea that the covenant, his covenant people, Israel, is going to be cut off. So he's going to judge Israel. This is the concept. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. See, it's not hard to understand, right? I'm, this is, here's how this is going to work. Judgment is coming. In, in a moment, he's going to describe to us why. I will stretch out my hand. The idea of stretching out his hand is, is I'm moving to action with all my power. This is not a statement of in a little while. This is a statement of here comes judgment. The the decision has been made. It is set in concrete. Here we go. Here comes judgment, moving into action. This is the same language that we saw used against Egypt and Pharaoh when the Lord said, I will stretch out my hand against Pharaoh. And so he's going to use the same power that he used to deliver the children of Israel from bondage to put the children of Israel back into bondage. <coughs> and the reason is, because no matter how many good things God promises his people, until the sin issue is dealt with, they keep going back to bondage. They keep going back to Israel. God promises them land and he promises them wealth and he promises them um, uh, that, the, the, that they'll have uh, more people than the sands of the seashore. In 1 Kings 4.20, in the reign of Solomon, it describes Solomon's reign as fulfilling all those things. But why couldn't they hold it? Because of sin. We're going to see the 10 reasons. When we look at those 10 reasons, we'll see them. But sin puts them where? In exile. And the Lord is going to say through the prophets, I look for someone to deliver, but there's no one. So by my right hand, I'll deliver them. What's the promise that he gives? Well, I'm going to give them a new heart for their heart of stone. I'm going to write my laws upon their heart. No man will have to say, look, there's God, for they're all going to know me. He made the promise of the new covenant, and that new covenant comes through who? Jesus Christ, right? So he's going to deliver them from sin. But here in Zephaniah, he's laying out the concept, hey, you have to find your hiding place in God. You have to find it in him, <clears throat> not in all these other places 
that they are looking. He says, I will cut off from this place the remnant of Baal. So he begins with, a, with what, who's going to be judged and why are they going to be judged. So he's saying, listen, I'm going to cut these off because. So here's your first of five reasons. I'm going to cut these off because, number one, idolatry. If you have a relationship with someone else and you want that relationship to end, just be unfaithful. Right? That's not a difficult concept for us to understand. If you are boyfriend and girlfriend or man and wife and you want that relationship to crumble, well, the first thing you have to do or the first thing you can do to make that happen is be unfaithful. That's what idolatry is. Idolatry is unfaithfulness to God. It's falling in love with someone else. <clears throat> Rather than loving the Lord, you love other gods. You love other forms of worship. So it's described here, I will cut off from this place the remnant of Baal and the name of the idolatrous priests along with the priests, those who bow down on the roofs to the hosts of heaven, those who bow down and swear to the Lord and swear by Milcom. So he first, the first section, he says, first reason for judgment, idolatry. <clears throat> Unfaithfulness toward God. You are still worshiping Baal, the god of the storm. You are uh, idolatrous priests. If you want to read about Josiah's judgment in his revival against the idolatrous priests, you can. 2 Kings 23 uh, talks about it. So if you have time, you can go take a look at those where he talks about the judgment of the priests who were doing these things. He says, those who bow down on roofs to the hosts of heaven. That was ancient horoscope to bow down to the hosts of heaven, to look in the stars for your future, to worship the host of heaven. God, the Lord talked about that multiple times. <clears throat> and then those who swear to God, hey, Lord, you're my Lord. And then they go home and pray to Milcom, to Milcom, another false god. So, so if you, the easiest way to understand idolatry is in the sense of a relationship between a husband and a wife. God has already declared Israel is his wife, and he's already declared her to be a harlot because she keeps wanting to sleep with everybody else. That's the picture of unfaithfulness and idolatry. So the first reason for God's judgment of his people, their idolatry. And he lists out all the ways <clears throat> that they are idolatrous. Now look at verse 6. He goes on. His second category, those who have turned back from following the Lord and do not seek the Lord or inquire of him. So the second reason for judgment is a defection from prayer and intimacy. Or if we want to understand that in terms of a relationship, they don't talk anymore. So if you're thinking about this in terms of relationship, we're trying to give uh, an illustration, husband and wife, unfit between them is going to cause a lot of problems the next thing that will cause a lot of problems they don't talk to each other anymore so god's second issue is you don't talk to me <clears throat> you don't talk to me we don't we don't talk anymore there's no there's no speaking you do not seek the lord <coughs> excuse me you do not <clears throat> seek the lord or inquire of him so I don't want to have anything to do with you. I don't talk to you. Second reason that God is going to bring judgment upon his people. He lays it out before them. They have declared their independence from God. Again, think about it in terms of human relationships. If you are married and your spouse declares their independence from you, they're unfaithful to you and they won't talk to you. What's happening to the relationship? Is it good? That's probably not going to make it, right? Seems bad. So this is what the Lord is declaring about. His covenantal relationship with Israel. The, hey, I don't know what's going on, but we're, we're not clicking. We're, this is not working out. This is not happening. 
And then he goes on in verse 7, be silent before the Lord God. So the idea is, you know, I have experienced this in, in uh, times in my own life. I don't know if you guys have ever, have you guys ever found yourself in a place where you're being rebuked? Anybody ever been rebuked? I'm the only guy. So when you're being rebuked, anybody ever start wanting to defend themselves in rebuke? Like, yes, I'd like to say something. So it's almost like the Lord in the middle of his talk with the nation of Israel. Hey, you guys are unfaithful to me. You're not talking to me. And it's like they're taking a deep breath to, to give a defense. And the Lord says, be silent before the Lord God. Don't talk. Now it's God's time to talk. It's the Lord's time to share. And he says, why? For the day of the Lord is what? The day of the Lord is near. Now for them, this is one of the things when we look at prophecy, we recognize that there are patterns in prophecy. Okay? So the nation of Israel is going to face judgment under Babylon. They're going to go to exile, and that's a little day of the Lord. But we also know that there is a day of the Lord coming at the end, right? Final judgment. God, the separation between the sheep and the goats, the Lord uh, standing in judgment over all the nations. And so, in a sense, you have the pattern of a local judgment that is going to fit over the pattern of a final judgment over all the earth. So the Lord is saying, look, the day, you're going to hear this phrase, the day of the Lord. If you look in, from verses 7 through 14, and you like writing in your Bible, feel free to circle that phrase because you're going to hear it over and over and over again. It's a day of God's judgment. Be silent for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests. And on the day of the Lord's sacrifice, we have group number three. I will punish the officials and the king's son and all who array themselves in foreign attire. So the third reason for judgment, that, that the nation of Israel, Judah, is following leaders who are opposed to God. You are following leaders who are in rebellion or opposition to God. Picture it like this. He says you're wearing foreign attire, right? Picture it like this. Let's say you made it to the Super Bowl. I don't even care what team. We'll make two, we'll make two made-up teams. So the two teams is Buell and Filer. They're playing in the Super Bowl. So obviously the best color is orange and black. So <clears throat> orange and black is, is playing red. Okay? So orange and black is the best color. Don't talk back. So, <laughs> so let's say you're playing for Buell, but you show up wearing filers colors are you gonna play no you you got to go over there you get the idea he says i'm going to judge the officials who are wearing foreign attire you're not submitted to israel as a nation you're not submitted to the lord god almighty who is ultimately the king of the nation you're in opposition you're wearing the other team's colors and the lord says you're you're here in our land, but you're wearing their colors. You're here, but you're acting like them. You, you are dressed like me and you use the words like you're part of us. In fact, Paul talks about this in Romans 9. <clears throat> in Romans 9, he says, not everyone who calls himself Israel is Israel. Right? Not everyone who makes the declaration, I'm a Christian, is a Christian. Is that true? <clears throat> You ever heard of someone in politics saying they're a Republican and acting like a Democrat? Okay, so you understand the concept. So the Lord is saying here, the third, the third reason for this judgment is you are following leaders who are in rebellion against us. So God says, I will punish the officials and the king's sons and all who are wearing the wrong team's colors all who are dressed in foreign attire, who are not for us, are not for 
the nation. Then in verse 9, he gives us the fourth. So we go on. On that day, I will punish everyone who leaps over the threshold and those who fill their master's house with violence and fraud. Now, right now you're saying, what? Right? Do you know what that means? Those who jump over the threshold? One of the most important things when we come to Bible study is familiarity with the Bible. Most of the time, if we bump into something we don't understand, it's something that was talked about somewhere else. Like 1 Samuel 5, 5. In 1 Samuel 5, 5, you'll remember that the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines. And they put it in the temple of, do you remember? They put it in the temple of Dagon. And then they kept walking out and Dagon kept being on his face in front of the, the ark. You remember the story? Well, when the priests of Dagon were dealing with this, it says in 1 Samuel 5, 5, this is why the priests of Dagon and all who enter the house of Dagon will not step on the threshold of Dagon of Ashdod to this day. So because of all of these things that went on, they had this superstition that we can't step on the threshold, so they jump over the threshold. So now re referring to that in Zephaniah, he's saying, I'm going to punish everybody who jumps over <coughs> the threshold or those who have adopted or imitate superstitious beliefs of the pagans. <coughs> it kind of goes back to the first one, right? You're officials, you're leaders of Israel, but you're really working for Babylon or for someone else, okay? Well, here he's saying, I'm going to punish all those who imitate the things that the pagans do just because that's what they do. Knock on wood. You know what I mean? So the idea that, the idea that he's laying out is, hey, there are things that we, things that are practiced in Israel that were, in opposition to God that they did just because all the nations around them did the same thing. So they wouldn't step on the threshold. Don't step on a crack, you'll... You get the idea? Okay, so, so I'm not trying to say those things are all some kind of horrific deal, but the point was you are following pagan traditions and you're participating in them because you want to be like them. They don't do this, so we're not going to do it. They act like this or they do these things, so we're going to act like this and do these things. And the result is you're filling your master's house, the Lord's house, with violence and fraud. You're filling the house with violence and fraud. And where does this lead to? He says in, uh, in verse 11, oh, let's back up to 10. Now on that day, declares the Lord, a cry will be heard from the fish gate, a wail from the second quarter, a loud crash from the hills. Wail, O inhabitants of the mortar, for all the traders are no more. All who trade out silver are cut off. And at that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps and punish the men who are complacent. Those who say in their heart, the Lord can't do anything about this. So his point is, there's going to come a day when the alarm's going to sound everywhere. That gate, that gate, that gate, the mortar in the walls is going to be crying out. Here it comes. <coughs> Economics are going to crash. You're not going to be able to buy or sell. You've, we've all heard that before, haven't we? <coughs> so, goodness gracious, what in the world? Uh, maybe I should try water. What do you think? Hmm. You're going to have to pray harder. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> the last point of judgment, he's saying the, the alarm's going to be sounded. The last point of judgment is on all those people who think God's not going to judge us. Verse 12 said, I'm going to bring, I will punish the men who are complacent, who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. God can't do nothing about this. Yeah, people have been saying forever, the Lord's going to come, the Lord's going to come, where is his coming? 
Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they always have. Right? Isn't that something that the Bible talks about? It says that the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness, but he is long-suffering toward us, desiring that no one would perish, but that all would come to, what's the next word? Repentance. Oh, that's interesting, right? So when we look at this, this is the fifth. So those are the five reasons, the first five reasons God's going to judge an ace. We have five more coming in chapter three. It, we are not going to get there yet, but we'll keep in mind the pattern, okay? Those five, God can't do anything about it. And then to the end of the chapter, from verse 14 on to the end, he describes the day of the Lord. And we need to be aware of the day of the Lord. Here is the description. The day of the Lord, by the way, is the day of God's judgment. There have been many days of the Lord, small days of the Lord, where God has judged nations. The Bible declares that God raises up kings and brings them down, right? He raises up nations and he brings them down. Those are examples of of little days of the Lord, God's judgment on a nation. Listen to how Zephaniah describes the great day of the Lord. Verse 14, the great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. So it's coming, right? Jesus talked about this as well. By the way, in Matthew 24, what did he tell you to do? He said, be ready. Ever since Jesus talked about that in Matthew 24, we have argued about when he's coming. Jesus didn't tell us when, did he? <clears throat> Doesn't say anything about when. What does he say? Be ready. Which means tomorrow, you don't say, I'm going to be right with the Lord tomorrow. You don't say, I'm going to repent tomorrow. If you want to be ready, then you're ready now. The great day of the Lord is near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. These are descriptions. This is judgment day. Judgment day is a day of darkness. If you remember, we've talked about this before, that the reason why the Jews run off of a lunar calendar is because they start with the darkness and then go to the light. Because judgment comes first and then the light. First darkness, then light. First judgment, then redemption. You get the idea? For example, Revelation 19. First Armageddon, then new heaven and new earth. Are you with me? So he's saying this is a, this, the sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. <clears throat> the mighty man cries aloud there. So even the hero, even the great hero, is panic stricken because in revelation 6 what does it say about that day it says the small and the great the rich and the poor hide under the mountains under the rocks cry out hide us from the wrath of the lamb the mighty man the hero the strongest of us is not able to stand before the lord god almighty in judgment no one can stand verse 15 a day of wrath is that day, a day of distress, a day of anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Sounds bad, right? Sounds bad, unless you have somewhere to hide. Where is it that you can hide from this judgment? That's right. You hide from it in Christ. Because you, as a believer, it is not appointed unto you wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are hidden with, uh, in God with Christ. We are hidden in him. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I've been crucified with Christ. There's already been a death paid for my debt, right? Isn't that what he's saying? I've been crucified with Christ. No longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live now, I live by the power of the Son of God 
who was given for me. So this expression, he's describing the terrors of standing before a holy God and not being holy. Bad day. Have you read the great white throne judgment? And the sea will give up the dead and Hades will give up the dead. The, all men, all the living will stand before the great white throne. It is a frightful thing to fall into the hands of a holy God when you are not holy. It doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you're Israel or the nations. We're going to see that next week. Everybody has the same deal, right? Everybody is standing, dealing with the same judgment. The mighty man cries. It's a day of wrath, distress, anguish. Ruin and devastation, a day of darkness, clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle against the fortified cities and the lofty battlements. Think of Revelation 19. Think of the big battles that are going to come from Babylon against Jerusalem and Judah. He's saying it's a day of battles. I will bring distress on, what's that word? Mankind. What does that mean? Is this a judgment only upon one thing? Is this only Israel? Is this only the nations? He says, I'm going to bring this against mankind so that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. What separates us from God? Why do men need salvation? Because we, we stand, we are, we are in essence birthed in a state of offense against God. And there's no way for us to save ourselves in that. So the Lord said, I have become your salvation. Now you can neglect so great a salvation, but what hope do you have if you do? Where else will you go? <clears throat> By what other name could you be saved? Their blood will be poured out like dust, their flesh like dung. Not, not their silver, not their gold will be able to deliver them from the wrath of the Lord. So can you buy your way out? Can you buy your way in? Nope. There's, none of that is going to deliver us. In the fire of his jealousy, all the earth will be consumed. Now you remember this, the, the, the description is that God is the husband whose wife has been unfaithful. Remember he created the heavens and the earth? He put man here. He gave him a garden. He gave him the sun for light, the moon for light at night. Gave him the stars as a guide. Gave him the seasons. There was a, a many gifts at the Lord. He gave him all the trees of the garden, save one, right? A lot of great gifts. The final gift that he's given is his son, Jesus Christ by whom all men may be saved. So, in the fire of his jealousy, all the earth will be consumed. It's all his. This is his. We have spurned the creator of the universe. What do we think we earn for that? For a full and sudden end he will make on all the inhabitants of the earth. Now, that seems kind of dark. And it's 8 o'clock, and I'm not going to leave you here. We're going to do chapter 2 next week, but we're going to read chapter 2, 1 through 3, because this is the center, the call for repentance. Here's the thing that says you're guilty before God. Can we acknowledge our guilt before God? Does God leave us in our guilt? No. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> here's what he says. Gather together. Yes, Gather, O oh shameless nation, before the decree takes effect, before the day passes away like chaff. Don't wait till the fire is falling, right? And when the fire is falling, it's probably too late. Before there comes upon you the burning anger of the Lord, before there comes upon you the day of the anger of the Lord, seek the Lord, all you humble of the land who do his just commands, seek righteousness, seek humility, 
Perhaps you may be, what's he say? Hidden. See how he's playing on the concept of the name of the prophet? The name of the prophet is hidden in God. He says, perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. Where are you going to be hidden? There's another great hymn. Is that me? I moved too much. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself, where? In thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. You remember when we go back to Moses. Moses is saying, Lord, I want to see your glory. And God says, you can't handle my glory. Some people think it's you can't handle the truth, but it's not. (laughs) You can't handle my glory. And Moses says, oh, Lord, really, I can handle it. No, 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 trust me. You can't handle my glory, but here's what I'll do. I'm going to take you, and I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock. So it's like picture a cut out in the side of a cliff or in a rock, and Moses backs into this little opening, this little cave. And then God puts his hand over him. And then the Lord allows his afterglow, the glory that trails behind him, like the dust that churns up when he walks by. And from that glory, with God's hand over the cleft, Moses' face shone for 40 days. He was hidden in the rock. Now let me ask you a question. Who's the rock? Dwayne Johnson says says he's the rock. But the real rock, (laughs) who's the real rock? The real rock is Jesus, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us that the rock that followed the nation of Israel, the one that Moses struck and the one that Moses was to speak to, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 10, that rock is Christ. The rock from which the cleft was where living water came out to water the nation is the place where Moses could hide and is the place where we escape the wrath of God in Christ Jesus because we are hidden in him. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless Look to thee for grace, foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. And while I draw this fleeting breath, with mine eyes, or when my eyes shall close in death, when I soar to worlds unknown, so thee, uh, or see thee on thy judgment throne. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. That's the center of the message of the prophet Zephaniah. Amen? All right, we'll jump into chapter two next time. Let's go before the Lord and pray. (coughs) Father God, we thank you for this time that we can come before you, God. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for who you are. We thank you that as we look in the pages of scripture, we recognize none of these things are accidental. This was all part of your purpose, part of your plan, and part of what you are accomplishing, what you are doing. So, Lord God, I just pray that you would help us see your plan to be saved from the wrath of God for our sin is to be found hidden in the cleft of the rock of Christ. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us recognize our need for a Savior, Lord, and bless our time as we continue to study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're so nice.
Father God, guide us as we leave from this place. Help us be your hands and feet. And we give you all the praise for it in Jesus' name.